Welcome to Norse Code, the number one podcast for your Minnesota Vikings. I am your host and producer. My name is James Fagoshnik. Thank you guys so much for listening. And at the other end of the tin can and string, we have our analyst and co-host. You know him from numerous blogs and podcasts around the internet, most notably from theathletic.com. He is useful human Arif Hassan. Arif, how is your desert wasteland today? <laughs> uh, it's it's going. I had a little bit of water, so... Uh... I'm good. We, we have like a whole quarantine procedure laid out. I had to like, I had, I went out with like gloves and we've got this alcohol spritzer. Um, so a lot of people know that Chelsea is a, is a pet behaviorist, my partner. Um, but her background is in microbiology. And so we've got like this whole, she knows the exact amount of time that, um, that like different pathogens can exist in, a particular disinfectants and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a whole process. I feel like I'm, I mean like a successful version of Chernobyl every time I come into the house. <laughs> Just, this, this really, as somebody who has admittedly read far too many dystopian novels, I feel like the, your, your choice and partner was based entirely on your on your history with reading those like who would be the best person to be involved with maybe not necessarily a fighter but i'm going to go on a scientific level and just be able to survive all of this <laughs> well it's not like i made a strategic decision oh horse crap just, that's exactly what this was no it, it's just very clearly like who who would i end up you know being in a relationship with someone who just happens to be very useful to have in a pocket i just think it's like a natural outcome of my relationship seeking paradigm, but I don't have to make it, you know, p- part of an explicit calculation. <laughs> okay, fine. Uh, we, we at Norse code, hope you are enjoying your social distancing, your, uh, however you are listening to the show, whether you are at home or at home or at home, or if you are driving to work, being essential personnel somewhere, or if you are, uh, out and braving the brave new world. I feel like the only reason to really leave the house now is for food, medicine, or if you have to leave, you should ha- make sure that on top of your vehicle, you have the guitar player and the flamethrower ready just so you can cross the, uh, just, you know, this is the perfect time to, to have your flamethrower guitar soloist just, just ready. Was that guy's name again? Doof? I, Big Doof? Great Doof? He was the, says something, Doof. I, I say that he was the like the best part of that movie. I don't know if that's accurate, but he really was just this iconic thing from the uh, from the Mad Max movie. Just really, it's Doof Warrior. Oh yeah, it's Doof Warrior. Doof, Hell yeah. Yeah, exactly. You need Doof in your life. Get yourself a Doof. He's almost as useful as a CJ Ham. Welcome to this episode of Norse Code. We have lots of departures to talk about, as it turns out. This is a very interesting uh, free agent season, and we will be talking all about that. We also have a uh, great mailbag. We have a couple of arrivals to discuss as well in a restructuring. And a discussion on who on the Vikings coaching staff would be best to play D&D with. Not kidding. That is one of the questions. So, uh, but before we do, just want to thank you guys so much for listening. Wherever you are, we hope you're safe. We hope you are enjoying this forced time with your families. Ahem. Uh, I'm not upset at all. (laughs) I'm not, I'm not stir crazy at all. I I don't have too many kids at all. So, uh, but again, thank you guys so much for listening. If you enjoy the show and would like to donate to the show, you can do so in one of two different ways. You can go to patreon.com slash Norse code. That's much more of a subscription base. We are offering uh, bonus episodes through Patreon. You can also go to paypal.me slash Norse code as well. Uh, thank you to everyone who signed up for Patreon for the bonus episode last week. If you are, if you'd like to listen to that, you can again, go to patreon.com slash Norse code. And for, tr- for tree fitty a month, you can access the bonus material. We will be providing another bonus episode this week. It will not be every episode. It's not going to be every episode, especially when we get into the regular season and there's so much content and, uh, and you know, we're pumping out 
five or not five hours, but close to uh, close to four, three and a half hours worth of shows for a week. We probably won't be doing it every episode, but we will be doing it on a uh, on a semi regular basis. So if you like the additional material, you can go to patreoncom slash code and subscribe. Uh, we will not only be doing Viking stuff, but we'll be branching out to a little uh, to some additional stuff as well. But just wanted to put that out there. If you like the material that we put out there. If you like the material that we're that we're you know that we're providing, you can get more of it at patreon.com slash Norse code. <laughs> How many times am I gonna say the the URL in the uh, in the episode? It's you know, it's not quite the 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 athletic thing where we said it like sixty times one episode, but it's pretty good. <laughs> That's what we get. So uh the fo- we just want to thank the following people for uh, for joining on Patreon this last week. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, thank you, Ra- uh, Rastel- Rastelin. You know, I feel like I've said that name a million times and I'll never get it right. So apologies. So, I, I think it's pronounced Raceland, and I only say that because when I listen to the Dragonlance audiobooks, one of the characters, na- that sounded crazy nerdy. <laughs> well, I've already committed. Let's keep going. Uh, one of the characters is named Raceland Majir. So that's how it is. That's what it, that's the name now. Sorry, guy. Sometimes, sometimes I just start a sentence and I don't know really where it's going to end when I finish it. <laughs> uh, Raceland, you know what? It's funny. I think at one point I messed up his name so badly that he sent in a pronunciation guide. Like, I feel like he actually provided something that said raced Len. Uh, at one point. Oh, wow. So, and we just like, we just straight ignored it. Uh, We're great well, at this. This, this the show has been on for six ish years, so it, it's possible that it's it, that I can forget these things. Um, yeah, whatever excuse you need. Uh, this, this helps me. Uh, Damian Barrett, thank you, Damian. Uh, also, thank you to Rob, Jordan, and Corey, who sent in a no- nice note who said, Love to be able to get amazing Vikings content in Portland, Oregon. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. Thank you guys so much for listening, for joining Patreon. And uh, we will continue to provide you with as much amazing Vikings content as we can moving forward into this potential regular season. (laughs) I like that the season has potential. It's like potential energy. Uh, (laughs) All right. Let's, we're going to start on the arrivals because it's somewhat less depressing. This has been an interesting off season to be sure. And we covered this last episode when we discussed the, uh, Stefan Diggs leaving and Kirk cousins signing. And that it seemed like we were getting a lot of different signals as far as what the team was attempting to do, whether this was a tank season, whether this was like, this was looking more like an eight and eight wasted year, whether this was looking at win now with the way that the contract for Kirk cousins was structured. And there have been a lot of interesting decisions as far as, uh, uh as far as the, the, the departures go. Uh, do we have any clearer of a picture as to what the Vikings are trying to do or what Spielman's trying to accomplish here? As of, the recording of this episode, which is uh, at 4 p.m. Central Time on Monday. Uh, no, uh, I, I don't think so. I published an article at The Athletic that talked about uh, this confusion. And uh, yeah, functionally, that's the problem is that the Vikings have made moves to uh, sacrifice future wins in 2022, especially uh, to create room to create wins now, which is a fairly common move for teams that are on the cusp of playoffs. And sometimes it pays off in terms of long-term wins as well. Um, but they've also made moves that have undercut their ability to win in 2020, but that do maximize their winning potential in 2022. Now, if done right, you know, you can kind of balance these two kind of competing, uh, stressors on how to build a roster. Uh, and, and build a roster that both is competitive now and will be competitive in the future. But it really doesn't seem like the Vikings are moving in that direction where they're, they're successfully able to accomplish both goals. Instead, it seems like every time they make progress towards one goal, they, they steal it from the other goal and that there's this kind of finite trade off that they have to incur. And they, they haven't made many moves that really give you access to both. And, maybe the one free agency signing they've made is the closest they've come to it. But uh, other than that, it really feels like they've undercut their ability in either of the two areas or in, in two circumstances, 
in both areas. So uh, right now, the Vikings are at a spot where it doesn't feel like there's a clear direction for the team where you can kind of bank on them to, to make enough moves to be better in 2020 or in 2022. Um, and uh, it, it would be tough for them to continue free agency uh, in a way that kind of resolves this question. Not impossible. There are certainly ways that they could do it. They could execute a couple of coups, make a bunch of smart free agent signings of, of young players that are likely going to be on the roster in 2022 and beyond um, and set the team up for success. The first week of free agency does not define your off season. It's just, you know, a pretty big chunk of it. Um, but this preview we've gotten so far, I think is, is very unclear. To be sure. Uh, the, the cousin con the cousin's contract especially which didn't get as much attention last week because of Diggs leaving and the seemingly endless list of people that are that, that are leaving the Vikings like this is an odd this is an odd way to to set up for a future so let's go over the big signing that that people are excited about is a uh, nose tackle Michael Pierce who looked really good as a, as a Raven. Yeah. Um, for, for most of his career, so he's an undrafted Raven from Samford. Um, and, uh, and, and he was able to play significant playing time as a rotational rookie. What's interesting is that because he's a nose tackle, he's behind another small school, uh, nose tackle in Brandon Williams from Southwest Missouri. Uh, and, uh, they're both really excellent. Um, and they've, they've shared time on the field together. And when Brandon Williams has been hurt or they felt the need to put two nose tackles on the field, something the Ravens are, are somewhat unique in, in doing. Um, Michael Pierce has been really excellent. Uh, he had uh, just a remarkable kind of all time season in 2017. He was about the best nose tackle in the NFL. And, and maybe if he had played more snaps, we, we probably could have considered him in that category along with like Damon Harrison and Linval Joseph. Um, and, uh, and, you know, depending on, on what you think Dominic Sue is, uh, and, uh, and from there, he hasn't been that good, uh, since 2018, he was really, really good. Not as good as 2017, 2019, it felt like he dropped off, but also there are some fairly unique circumstances. The first is that they moved Brandon Williams to three technique in order to get Michael Pierce, uh, the full-time starting job. And so he had, I think 15 starts or so, uh, in 2019, uh, which brought his total number of starts up to 30. Um, so it was his full, first full time, uh, year as a starter. But the problem is he entered camp overweight. And for a nose tackle, that's pretty significant. He is supposed to weigh, he's supposed to weigh 340 pounds at six feet. He's already meant to be, uh, a Coke can, essentially. He's already meant to be like very big. Uh, and he weighed in at about 390 pounds when he entered training camp, which was so bad that uh, John Harbaugh wouldn't let him practice for his own safety. Uh, and that may have and, – and he said he got his weight down by the time the season started, and that's probably true. But maybe the manner in which he got his weight down so quickly um, or, the, or the fact that he was carrying around that much weight uh, for such a period of time may have contributed to uh, a series of ankle injuries that he had throughout that year that may have hurt his uh, his performance in 2019. So uh, 2019, not nearly as good as as the rest of his time with the Ravens, but for the most part, he has been really excellent. And if you take a look at any number of measures and compare them to other nose tackles across the NFL, over the course of those four years combined, which includes 2019, but also gets to include 2017, um, he's been a top five nose tackle by like PFF grade or tackles or... Uh, run stops, which are tackles that occur at or near the line of scrimmage, um, you know, on off, you know, he's the, the Ravens run defense has been much better with him on the field than off the field, um, that sort of stuff. So um, he's been a really good nose tackle. He's coming off a down year, which is probably why he's a little bit cheaper. What's really interesting is that, so obviously the Vikings, you know, if you compare Linval Joseph's old contract with the Vikings to Michael Pierce's new contract, they save I want to say like $4 million in cap space or something like that. If you compare it to uh, Joseph's new contract with the Chargers, um, the Vikings only are paying, I think, $500,000 more, 
for a younger player who is probably better at this point in their career, though he probably doesn't have the same pass rush upside. I think, you know, when a lot of people talk about Michael Pierce, they talk about how he's a really, really great run stopper and not that great a pass rusher. I think he's probably better than he's given credit for when you compare him to other nose tackles. He's about average in terms of pass rush. Either you can take a look at it from, I think, uh, a film criticism standpoint, I would say he's about average, or you can take a look at it from a pressure production standpoint. Uh, you can either use, you know, the sport radar slash next gen's pressure definition, or you can use uh, PFF's pressure definition, or you can take a look at PFF pass rush grade. He's about average, um, which I think is is not great in terms of generating pass rush. You want to take him off on third downs, but it doesn't mean he's a liability on first down when teams decide to pass. So, um, it is probably an upgrade that saves the Vikings money. It's a relatively efficient signing. It also happens to be at a position that matters a lot less. For the Vikings, it might matter more because they're so reliant on how good that third down defense is that they want to craft or create good third downs. So they emphasize the ability to win first down in order to create second and long and third and long. And that ability to create third and long is one of the reasons that they have had two of the best third down defenses in NFL history. In fact, I want to say in 2016, they had the the top third down defense in NFL history. And then in 2017, they beat it. Um, and so that ability has been kind of crucial to how the defense has been defined and designed. And so it may be more important for the Vikings than for other teams. So uh, it's kind of interesting, you know, from an analytics perspective, you know, I think broad strokes, it doesn't make sense. But when you start digging into kind of the way the Vikings defense is designed, you can begin to justify it. Um, I don't know what the, the true answer is here, but I would say if you're only looking at it in terms of the nose tackle market and how much he signed for, I think what he his average uh, sal- or his salary, yeah, his average salary at time of signing consumes like the 10th most percentage of the cap out of all nose tackles um in in to sign deals in the past five years so uh not a bad signing when you only take a look at it from the perspective of of comparing him to other nose tackles so the other i guess arrivals it's it's not much not much of an arrival thing it's more just kind of re-signings so we have ham we have colquitt we have bailey uh the franchise tag was put on anthony harris uh eric wilson was tendered kirk cousins was extended and Daniil Hunter appears to have restructured. Is that right? Yeah. So uh, Daniil Hunter, uh, they just converted uh, almost his entire base salary into signing bonus. This is something that the Vikings have baked into player contracts for the past couple of years that they can automatically restructure um, deals like this. And it doesn't really hurt the player because his take-home pay is basically the same. Um, it just gets converted into a lump sum, in theory, a lump sum at the beginning of the year. Now, there's different payout methods. You can uh, put it in escrow and, and pay it out, or you can uh, schedule payments for a signing bonus. But in theory, it's it's a lump sum that they get at the beginning of the year instead of a base salary that gets paid out in portions over the course of 17 or, I guess, now 18 weeks uh, in 16 or, I guess, 17 checks um, because players... I don't think get an actual check uh, on their bye week. Um, and so it, th- he's getting the same amount of money this year, but it's essentially an accounting trick that uh, spreads out the hit of the base salary this year over the life of the contract or the next five years of the contract, whichever is shorter. Uh, and so uh, because his contract is, is still got like four years left, um, $2 million of that hit gets assigned this year and then, and then two million next year, and two million after that, and two million the year after that, um, and so it frees up about six million dollars of cap space. So when you combine that with the Kirk Cousins restructuring, which we'll talk about in a second, uh, and we talked about a bunch in the last episode, um, that frees up altogether about sixteen million dollars in cap space, which gives you enough room to do stuff like sign Michael Pierce. So uh, that's that's what that is. It, it kicks the can down the road. Um, makes things a little bit more difficult uh, in in 2021 and 2022 in terms of uh, cap space, but that's where the Vikings have some available cap space uh, thanks to the dig trade. So um, yeah, that's a uh, that's that's it's it's a very functional move. They they did it with Kendricks, I think, 
uh, last year. Um, they've done it with other players before. So, uh, yeah, they just restructured his contract. He didn't even have to or get to, depending on how you look at it, agree to it. It's just something that was already baked into the deal that he signed, that they can just do that. Yeah. Now let's talk about some departures. Because let's let's be honest, this there were a couple of not necessarily the surprises, but there were a few things on here that were well, I mean, one it, one for me was a surprise, and you hadn't, and you forgot to put it in the show notes. How do you forget about the first round wide receiver talent that that is that was Laquan Treadwell, who has now left the Vikings for the Falcons, who are expecting big things from him based on one big Twitter things. clip? Uh, yeah, I. I've neglected my duties. <laughs> <laughs> the person we have to start because Laquan Treadwell, who might not make it through camp, <laughs> right? <laughs> he's he is now a Falcon. I'm. I, it's not like I'm super surprised that another team picked him up or something. I am surprised that they're. Uh, have they announced the money involved in that? I, I forget. I don't think they have. I'm sure it's for something minimum. What's interesting to me is that no team picked him up after the Vikings cut him um, last year. So clearly when the Vikings re-signed him uh, and played him, he must have shown teams something in the final year with the Vikings. And, you know, I, I guess it, it's very clear that he did improve. Um, but he also like got beat by a seventh round pick for the third receiver spot. So like how much did he improve? Well, enough to get on the field, I guess. Um and here's one of the issues with like transitioning from a blogger to transition to somebody who's in the facility every so often is, uh, you know, you, you, you come face to face with the players a lot more often. I'm in the locker room and I talk to them. Um, and it's like much more difficult to be like super harsh on a player after like you ask how like their kids are doing or whatever. Um, and you know, it's like part of the appeal of, of, of the way a lot of bloggers write, including me, is that I'm like pretty harsh on people that I don't think are very good at football. Uh, famously so. Um, Especially but, when you name your, name your articles basically that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they get attention. Um, that said, I mean, Laquan Treadwell is like just not good. Um, he also like very clearly cares a lot, works a lot. You know, if you ask Mike Zimmer, he might work too hard in the wrong areas in terms of his ability to improve. He works a lot, and he is genuinely convinced he'll be a good receiver uh, in a way that's, like, not arrogant, but is, like, hopeful. And, like, you talk to him, and you realize that it's, like, genuine, right? It's He's not just um, talking, right? He's not saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to start this year when like Adam Thielen and Stefan Diggs are on the roster and he says it and you're just like, well, every receiver wants to say that. Uh, no, he's, that's like something that like he believes, right? Um, and so you don't want to like bag on a guy for working really hard to achieve a dream that he thinks is possible. But he's also like just not like good, right? And so, uh, it was interesting when the Falcons signed him and there was like a lot of people that like praised the signing. Which to me, it, it's basically like, you know, the Vikings sign, uh, who do they sign like at the beginning of, of 20, like Lestar Gene, just like some receiver, right? Um, or, or the Giants, uh, Tavares King, right? Like two years ago. Um, not even like a Kendall Wright, who was also like a former first round pick, but was like productive in the NFL, but like someone who, if they're lucky, makes the roster, like praising those signings is very, unusual to me like i get like oh you signed cfl superstar brandon zilstra like hey maybe he'll turn into something that's like that's praiseworthy right um or you sign undrafted free agent chad bb hey he's got a lineage he's a really great punt returner you know maybe that'll turn into something um but like a guy with four years in the league without being productive it's just like weird that it was notable enough to get praised and a lot of people did it and a lot of people were talking about how he improved his final year uh with the vikings Without like thinking like, well, he got cut like right away and then he came back and was fine. Like he wasn't a liability and that's a really big step up. Um, but it was, it was very weird to see the signing kind of met with 
uh, positive attention. I don't think it deserves negative attention. It's just like a camp signing at this point. But it, it was it was unusual that like a lot of people were like, all right, great. You know, maybe the Falcons will get something out of him. And it's like, well, I mean, like, it's not the Vikings. I don't think the, he had like four different receivers coaches. I don't, I don't know, man. Even like the Ole Miss receivers coach was like, yeah, I don't know if he knows how to run routes. Um, so, I, yeah, it's, I, I hope he does well. I hope he beats out Calvin Ridley on the depth chart. That would be fun, honestly. And let's be honest, the reason why he was on the roster at all was because of the terrible depth that all of a sudden we had at the wide receiver position when Adam Thielen went out with an injury for an extended period of time. Yeah, and I think Josh Doxson got hurt too again. Yep. I um, did Josh Doxson play a single down for the Vikings? I don't know that he I don't did. Think so. Yeah, he but was like, he was signed when he was hurt and then he never got better. Yeah, so Yeah. We had we it, had it, first round talent at the wide receiver position, just like the Falcons do now. <laughs> well, they've got a lot of first round talent at the receiver position. Yeah. I I I got into this weird argument on NFL Reddit. It wasn't last year, I think it was did. the year before. It sounds like a story I would tell. Like this is the <laughs> beginning of a story. <laughs> well, somebody was like somebody was doing a breakdown of of what to expect from uh, from NFC North teams and talking about like the, the the wide receiver situation, whatever. And somebody had said, you know, the top three wide receivers for the Vikings were. I think we still had Jarius Wright on the on the team at the time. It was like it was it was Diggs, it was Thielen. And then it was Treadwell. And I responded with, I'm not sure on that last one. And he got all he got all upset about like how I was questioning his analysis. Like, you clearly haven't watched Treadwell, have you? Like he had <laughs> one catch the year before. He had two or three the year after that. Like the my favorite tre- Treadwell memory is him catching the touchdown in Seattle and me going up to a bunch of people, a bunch of Vikings fans in our section and high fiving like ho- and ever to a person everyone was like, "Holy crap, he was useful." <laughs> <laughs> that was the that was the touchdown that the Falcons Twitter tweeted out, right? No, that was the. Like, that hey, was, hopefully we get more of these. No, yeah, that, well, that was luck. the that was the one against the Packers. That, that oh yeah did. oh that was his first touchdown right yes i believe <laughs> you know honestly i would have to check um but it was late enough in the year that i think that this would have been maybe his second touchdown ever but yeah Incredible. it was just like it was so out of contact like out of out of con- because it was shortly after we had like the digs got hurt on the field and cook got hurt on the field, like in the same play. And just like, Oh my God, the, our entire offense is going to die now. Oh my God. Treadwell is apparently a savior. What is, <laughs> I, I do not understand what is happening on the field in front of me. Laquan Treadwell. Well, now you can get that Jersey, that, that nice 11 Jersey for real cheap. Um, but the rest of the team, like the rest of the departures, there's some kind of odd stuff in here. Uh, we, we talked about Xavier Rhodes being cut before. We talked about Linval Joseph being cut. He's now a member of the Chargers, correct? Uh, yeah, he's a member of the Chargers. He replaces Brandon Meebane. Um, the Chargers will be an interesting fit because they have run both 4-3 and 3-4 looks over the past couple of years. I'm not sure what they'll run um, this year. I'm just not familiar enough with the Chargers. Um, but uh, I assume a 4-3 because he's a one-gap uh, one nose tackle generally. But I think he can two-gap, and so uh, and maybe they'll do some hybrid fronts there. He could be pretty useful there. Um, yeah. I don't know that the Chargers are like good enough to do anything about it. But <laughs> yeah, the, you know, the, hey. The, the Chargers had all sorts of, of, of opportunity to do something this offseason. I don't know what they did. But we I, have. I don't like trade up for a quarterback in the draft. Yeah. And they trade. They traded Russell Okung for a guard. Who did they trade for? I can't. Yeah, even they remember. traded for a guard. I know that uh, that their running back left and decided to stay within the division just to spite them. Uh, I love those storylines. I really wish they like worked out for the Vikings because <laughs> they signed so many in division players. Yes, they just like wash out. <laughs> I mean, like I'm so, 
Well, even the Bears, the Bears picked up a terrible, noted terrible tight end. Um, oh God, his name escapes me. He's he's so mediocre now. He used to be really good. Uh, who did it was the it was the tight end for the Packers last year? Oh, Jimmy Graham. Yes. Yeah. I mean, like, I want his like I want him to just just rain all over the Packers for those two meetings and for the rest of the season, just nothing. Like he can't I, I, I do I do like the idea that Mitch Trubisky will unlock what Aaron Rodgers could not. <laughs> That's good. And against the Vikings, it'll be throw it'll be like using like throwing left too. It'll be great. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> fantastic so why did the vikings cut josh klein exactly okay so it was initially reported by a number of people and i repeated this that cutting josh klein only saved the vikings about 1.5 rather than like 1.466 million dollars in cap space um that is not the case because his uh 2020 salary was going to be guaranteed on the fifth day of the league year uh and he was cut before then so it actually frees up like 1.8 million more than that. Uh, so like 2.4 million or about. Um, so it, or maybe even more than that. Am I doing the math wrong? Yeah, like 3.1 million. I don't know. It frees up much more money than we thought. Yeah, it has to be like 3.3 million. I wrote it correctly in the article. Um, but yeah, I think it's over 3 million. Um, and so it does save more space than you would have expected. And honestly, if you told me, um, you could sign somebody for 3.3 million and they would play as well as Josh Klein played. I would say that you got a little bit of a deal, but you didn't get like a steal or a crazy bargain. So it makes a little bit more sense. Uh, it's still, I don't love it for a lot of reasons. Um, and I think people kind of know why. So it's not just that they don't save that much cap space by doing it. Um, that's like the least important reason. It's just that was more of a kicker on top of, of, of the other stuff which was that they already have a need at guard and we're thinking of filling it by moving a tackle to guard and drafting a tackle because this guard class is just like not that amazing. Uh, and so uh, you already want to replace one of your guards in, in Pat Elfline, or maybe they don't. Maybe they're like very happy with Pat Elfline and they think they can unlock it. But like we, you know, want the Vikings to replace Pat Elfline at guard and also hope that Garrett Bradbury like becomes a good center, um, which... Yeah, that's that's possible. I, I feel like his PFF grade is weighed down by like four games plus the Falcons game, which doesn't factor a ton into the PFF grade because he only had 10 pass blocking snaps, but looks real bad on the screen because uh, he had like a zero pass blocking grade because he gave up one pressure and 11 snaps. Um, but uh, <laughs> if, if, if we're waiting for Garrett Bradbury to be good and we haven't seen like confirmation that he is yet and Pat Offline hasn't been good at either center or guard, and Josh Klein was the best performing interior offensive lineman. You already have a need on the interior offensive line, one that can improve another member of the interior offensive line. And then you just kind of give up on, on the other one. And I think, I think Klein played well. I think, oh, well, was he ranked 46th of 82 guards, according to Chris Thomason and PFF. And I think it underrates him, uh, which is not to say I think he's like amazing, right? I think he's uh, played in an average to above average level. Um, but, you know, I think PFF assigned some pressures to him that were more appropriate to Brian O'Neill. I felt like that happened a couple of times this year, uh, which, you know, gave O'Neill some credit in terms of his sack streak. We've talked about this uh, before. Um, so when you, like, account for that, I think that he actually played even better than his PFF grade. Uh, and so you you get rid of somebody who's legitimately average to above average uh, and now you have to fill out two guard positions. Now, if the Vikings are super confident in Drew Samia, which I never got the impression that they were, um, probably based on the fact that I don't know, I don't think he was ever active on game day. They would much rather have had Dakota Dozier out there, who is a guy. Um, <laughs> For a backup, Dakota Dozier was was not awful, but you know, you never were happy when he came into the game. Like he wasn't like. Okay, so Drew Smith was active for two games. Um, but you were never, like, comfortable when Dakota Dozier came into the game in a way that you could kind of be with Rashad Hill. Um, and so he couldn't beat out Dozier for a spot on the active roster. And it would be surprising to me if the... And, and one of the two games he was active for was the Chicago game, right? That doesn't even count. Um, so 
are they confident in Drew Samia? I don't see what would be an indication of that except getting rid of Josh Klein. And with no indications before that of being confident in him, I would be shocked if that was kind of the plan going forward. Um, now, Klein is not like a system fit for the running game uh, in the same way everybody else on the offensive line is, uh, which I don't think means he's a, a, a system non-fit. I think he does okay. Um, he's pretty decent at, at reach blocks and zone. He's pretty decent at getting up at the second level. He's pretty decent at moving laterally. Um, he's not great or amazing at any of those things, but he's also like not as big a liability as, like, say, Will Hernandez might be. As a, as a zone blocker. Uh, and so that could be a reason. Um, maybe, you know, Stefanski really liked Josh Klein a lot and, and Kubiak didn't. I don't know. Um, it should be weird because they should both just kind of be relying on Rick Dennison for this sort of thing. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think it's a great move or a smart move, but I do think that once you take into account that the cap hit freed up by cutting him was actually a little bit better than, than was initially reported and that he's not like a running game system fit, you can kind of see it. Again, um, I don't really think the run game is so important that you should cut like a really good pass blocker for somebody who's at least average-ish at the running game. Um, so I don't love it, but that might be the reasoning. They tried to get him to negotiate down the deal. Uh, and like another kind of tertiary reason that they would cut him is to provide leverage in future negotiations with other players. Uh, when they're saying, hey, uh, we need you to restructure this or we'll just cut you. Um, they've got some credibility now that they've actually done it a couple of times, including with Josh Klein. So maybe maybe that's part of the reasoning too. But yeah, I don't love it. I don't think it's a great football move. Maybe it's like a great negotiating ploy. I mean, it still kind of flies in the face of the whole kind of where is this team going thing. Like, if you are in a win now situation, you probably don't dismantle whatever offensive line you had. So it, again, it's just kind of a weird series of questions as far as where the offense is going. Right. You're creating another hole, especially one that will be difficult to fill because unlike with the Stefan Diggs trade or the proposed Anthony Harris trade, you're not getting anything back that would allow you to fill what you just lost, right? Like, if Anthony Harris gets traded for a second round pick, which would be pretty great, um, you could like draft Antoine Winfield or something, right? Which is like the most common safety drafted to the Vikings for some reason. I haven't figured it out yet. Um, but you could draft a safety and, with that second round pick and boom, solved. Uh, Stefan Diggs, you got a first round pick. You could draft a receiver, boom, solved. But with like cutting Josh Klein, who's a starting guard, you can't just be like, Oh yeah, we'll like use next year's fourth round compensatory pick we'll get from him, trade it for a fifth, draft a guard with that, and you get a starter. Like, no, it's not going to happen. Um, a, because he's not going to sign for any compensatory thing because you've cut him. Uh, but B, you can't really count on a fifth round guard to start right away, can you? Drew Sami is not starting, and they cut the last fifth round guard, Colby Gossett. Um, so yeah, it, it, that that one's tougher. Because you don't get a, a 2020 asset to um, to sign, but now now you freed up I think 19, including the the Hunter deal and the and the Cousins deal. Um, so maybe with that cap space, but there's I looked at the the free agents on the guard market and it's just abysmal. Um, you'd have to go after a tackle, uh, either uh, trade for like say Trent Williams or. Uh, sign someone like Jason Peters and, and push Riley Reef inside. And now you've got one of your guard spots filled and now you have to figure out the other guard spot. The problem with that, of course, is that now when you draft a player, you kind of have to draft him to play guard because you're not going to push Trent Williams inside to play the other guard spot. Um, so you need to have, draft a guy that you think can play tackle, uh, that, that can play guard, um, which is like possible, right? Like if you put Riley Reef at left guard and you put, say, Josh Jones at right guard, and then Trent Williams retires at the end of that year, you can move Josh Jones back to left tackle or something or or, or whatever, um, and then uh, find another guard at some point. But it, it does become more difficult to fill uh, the Josh Klein spot, but it's possible. So, yeah, they, they, don't, they didn't make a move that gives you the room or the resources to, to solve that problem right away. Um, 
it's it's a it's a more difficult one to figure out in terms of like the direction of the team because he wasn't playing that poorly. If it was Pat Elfline who was cut, I think ninety percent of Vikings fans would have been would have been pretty on board with it. So um yeah, i I don't love it and I think it's confusing, but you know, maybe there's reasons. And Everson Griffin appears to have broken off any negotiations with the Vikings as per a couple of reports and the uh, Instagram post. Yeah. Yeah. He, he posted essentially a goodbye, a uh, pretty poignant goodbye on, uh, on Instagram uh, saying goodbye to Minnesota. He loved his time here and he's like moving on and stuff. It was pretty clear that that was like, uh, I'm done with uh, Minnesota. I'll be moving uh, elsewhere sort of thing. Um, so yeah, that one's tough. Obviously the Vikings, uh, really thought that they would have gotten it back. Mike Zimmer said at the combine that they expected him to come back. I'm sure the next time, uh, we in the media get to talk to Mike Zimmer, we'll bring it up and he'll be like really ticked off at us. But like, also we kind of want to know what the hell happened. You said he was coming back. What did, did talks break down? Were, were, you, were you just like disagreeing on numbers and just decided to break it off? Like what happened? Um, but I, I think they had in their plans that he would come back. Uh, which would be great because either he's a starter and he was really good, especially in the first half of the year, or he's this really great rotational pass rusher in the same way that like D Ford was for the 49ers or uh, Jihad Ward was for the, for the Baltimore Ravens um, where he would come in on like third down or obvious passing downs uh, and push Fadio Danabo inside or play inside himself like he did for the saints. Uh, and you would get a really great third down package. Um, but you know, I guess that's not happening. He's he's apparently going to sign elsewhere. So, I I I feel like the Vikings miscalculated, uh, and and that's on them. But it does make it more difficult to say, here's the plan for winning in 2020. We've gotten rid of someone who's talented, which is not the same as saying they were that the contract Everson Griffin was playing under was uh, one that was necessarily returning fair market value. Although after uh, he restructured it in 2019. I think it kind of was actually, but uh, without having a deal in place and letting him void the contract um, without signing a new deal, uh, they end up in a spot where it's again, difficult to build uh, around 2020. Um, he's a good player. He's going to sign somewhere. He's going to produce. Hopefully I think his best role right now is to play as a designated pass rusher. I think the reason that he kind of fell off uh, for a big chunk late in the season, and obviously he turned up, uh, in the in the playoff game against the the Saints, so it's not like he just fell off a cliff or anything. But I think the reason the second half of the season was not as spectacular was because you know, he's an older player, and so uh, playing as many snaps as he did probably made it difficult for him to keep up his level of play. If he gets to be a designated pass rusher or a rotational guy or something like that in a heavy rotation, kind of like what the Eagles do, um, I think he would be really spectacular. So, yeah. Uh, it sucks because I think he'd be a valuable part of the team or a valuable asset to let the Vikings win. Who is his uh, replacement? For some reason, my my memory is not. Uh, not I, I think me. it's a Fadio Denebo. Yeah, Denebo, um, that's right. I, yeah, I would not be shocked if the Vikings signed a replacement. I know that um, there's a rumor that that Jadavian Clowney was talking with the Titans, and or or a rumor that that he was signing with. The, the Seahawks, uh, I would not be shocked if the Vikings reached out to him. Obviously not at the $20 million a year amount that he wants, but um, I would not be shocked if they did that. There's a couple of other edge rushers. Um, they might, you know, go all in and try to trade for Yannick and Gakwe. Apparently, the, the Ravens aren't even picking up the phone for these trades, so they're just going to franchise a guy and try to levy on Bellum out of a season, uh, which I don't think is going to work nearly as well for pass rusher as it did for running back. Um, but, you know, maybe they, they try to trade for Ngakwe, which would be uh, pretty uh, interesting and, and spectacular kind of uh, big move that would clarify the direction of the team in a way that I think would help. Um, or they could go with Afadi, who I think has played well enough that he could be considered a starter. I asked Zimmer about this. He's usually very frank. You know, you ask him, is Holton Hill good enough to be a starter? He says, not yet. You ask him if Afadi Odenabo is good enough to be a starter, and he says, yes, absolutely. I think that tells you something. Um and, uh, and, and, and that would be great, but they are lacking depth there. Um, another move kind of that the Vikings let happen was that, uh, Stephen Weatherly signed, I want to say with the Panthers in free agency. Yeah. Um, for more than I would have paid him. So I think it was fine to let him go. Um, but, uh, yeah, they, they don't really have defensive ends, um, on the roster right now. So they have to add a few. 
Um, maybe maybe the one they acquired from the Bills really late in the season. Um, forgetting his name off the top of my head. Uh, it could be good because I thought he looked pretty good in the preseason, which I think is why the Vikings got him because when the Vikings played the Bills, he went off. Um, so uh, it's easy to remember that. Uh, you know, maybe he he becomes really good depth because the Vikings are really good at identifying and coaching up this kind of talent. But they do need to add some some bodies, and so missing out on Everson Griffin I think hurts in a couple of ways. And that you don't add depth, and then you're also potentially missing out on a starter. And Mackenzie Alexander left. Yeah, that was pretty expected. Um, talked about it on this podcast, talked about it on a football machine. Um, that Alexander, uh, maybe he came to terms with playing in the nickel, but it certainly seemed like for a large portion of the time, he was kind of upset with the Vikings for not having opportunities to play on the outside. But the biggest issue he had was how the Vikings kind of treated him at the end of the season, first by playing him in the week 17 game, uh, where they only play backups. And so playing him is kind of a slap in the face, but more importantly, he was on the injury report. And so if this, if there was any week to rest, it would have been that one because they didn't have a buy. And uh, after playing that game, you know, he had to get a uh, season ending surgery, which seems weird to say about a week 17 injury. But of course, the Vikings played two more games and he couldn't participate. And of course, the Vikings relied on Andrews and Deo to play in the slot, which for one game worked out really remarkably, incredibly well. But for another game did not, you know, bear as much fruit. So um, he I think he was pretty upset with the Vikings about that and wasn't willing to sign with them. Um, you know, a lot of people see what was it one year, four million dollars. Um and like, oh, the Vikings couldn't pay that? No, absolutely they would. I think they would have loved to have him at that price. I think Darren Wolfson even said that they had an offer um, for a little bit less, I want to say, uh, according to Wolfson, um, on the table for him, and and he wasn't interested. So, uh, yeah, the Vikings probably would have been willing to pay one year $4 million, um, but I think he just didn't want to come back. So that one's tough. You can't yeah. really blame the Vikings for letting it happen, but at the same time, you can because they're the ones who screwed him. But instead of saying it's on Rick Spielman, it's it's more in this case on Mike Zimmer. Trey Waynes and Mackenzie Alexander over there. Trey Waynes getting some serious money. Yeah, good move not paying him. I thought Waynes probably worth around eight nine million. Um, so letting him sign for I want to say fourteen a year. Um, yeah, it's so you're losing talent, but it, if you're cap strapped. You can't, you can't make moves necessarily to, to do the, to do anything about it. So, um, the Vikings were probably in the right here. Now, obviously, they doubled down on this need at corner. Uh, Mike Hughes is going to be one of the starters, so that's one of your three corners. But, but we don't have solutions at the other two yet. And also, uh, Andrew Sandejo ended up uh, signing as well, but just not with the Vikings. Oh, yeah. Um, that, I don't want to say it's like tough, right? Because how much are you necessarily losing? But um, he would have been a really nice floor uh, for the Vikings. I think that you would have created uh, a, a level of talent at safety where you wouldn't have gone below it. Um, you know, he knows the system really well. One of the reasons that Mike Zimmer likes him is that he's really smart safety, that he doesn't make a ton of mistakes diagnostically. If he's making mistakes, it's more you know, footwork related or sort of technical mistake or something like that. Um, and I know Vikings fans well remember those technical mistakes, but um, diagnostically he was kind of always in the right spot and he knew where he needed to be. Um, so that, I mean, that's tough. I think I thought the Vikings would reach out to him to try and get him to sign for another year just so that they could have solutions at safety, but they've got nobody besides Harrison Smith at, at safety on the roster. If they trade Anthony Harrison and it does seem like that they want to do that. So, um, that, I think that's an issue. I, that's how, how are you going to get enough safeties on the roster where you're comfortable with the level of backup play? So, like, let's say you trade Anthony Harris for a second round pick, uh, and and you draft whoever the top safety is uh, in the second round, right? Great, you've got um, Ashton Davis or or Antoine Winfield or whoever, right? Um, now Harrison Smith goes down for two games. Um, who's going to be behind him? Like an undrafted free agent, some uh, safety you picked up off the street? Are you going to convert uh, one of your safeties into a corner? Nate Metters played safety for a half a second. Maybe, you know, he's technically on the roster. Maybe he'll play safety. Like it's, You're not confident that somebody has the ability to play a baseline level of play um, if that happens. And if they don't trade Anthony Harris, now they don't have that second round pick, it's the same situation, right? 
Um, do you draft a safety in the fourth or fifth and, and hope that he's competent enough to fill in right away in case one of them gets injured? Maybe. Um, they do have a lot of picks, but uh, there's only so many of them that they have in the top 100, which is really where um, a lot of your starting level talent comes from. So, uh, yeah, it's... I, I don't think that played out well for the Vikings. That's in Deo side elsewhere. It is kind of odd that it, when he left, everyone, okay, well, he's kind of an overly violent player or whatever. Um, he was responsible for a lot of flags on, uh, on defense. And when he came back this last time, he was successful. He did really well. And it, it's, you know, good for him for being able to catch on somewhere. But I will say that, it's not that I, ex- I ex- expected him to come back, but I would have liked for him to come back, if nothing else. But Yeah, I think uh, I think it would have really helped the Vikings out. Even if he'd never seen the field if he came back, it would have helped out the Vikings just having that kind of depth available. Yeah, he, he's a great depth guy. He's, he's fantastic at that. So, you know, Stephen Weatherly also leaving and, and Stefan Diggs trading. This is just... It, it, looking at the list of departures, you know, we, we've kind of beaten this horse to death, but this is a list of departures that I wouldn't necessarily have expected for a team that is putting themselves in an awkward cap position with, uh, or you know, well, awkward cap position thanks to the Kirk Cousins extension. Yeah, and, and they free up all this cap to do what? Like, sign Michael Pierce that I mean the Vikings have been through quiet off seasons before quiet free agency periods before and it hasn't felt like they took significant steps back I mean they had like a quiet off season I want to say like last year who they signed a free agency last year no one um now I'm trying to think I don't think they signed well they signed Josh Klein yeah which turned out to be pretty good unless you ask them they cut them so I guess they didn't love it. <laughs> they have a slightly but, different, you know. Yeah. Uh, Shamar Stefan, which um, that was a mistake, I guess. But, well, they didn't cut him. Maybe they didn't think it was a mistake. But I think I think the client signing was good and the Shamar Stefan signing was a mistake. And they had the opposite opinion on both. Uh, <laughs> um, but, yeah, they didn't, like, sign too many free agents. And none of us were like, wow, what direction is this team headed in? That's not great. We're no, like, yeah. When I mean, you do that, it's basically complete. Yeah, when you do that, it's obvious that the, the projection of the team is just, we're keeping things together, we're going to refine a few things, we're going to move forward with what we got. Now it's, well, the defense is gutted. The offense is going to look hella different. <laughs> like, But our special teams are set. Yeah, if you go uh, from 2014, to, and the special teams are set, if you go from... 2014 to 2019, I don't think there's a year in between where the starters in in week one were all that different from uh, there were more than nine starters in or less than nine starters in week one of one year that weren't starters for a majority of the games or expected starters uh, from from week one uh, the year prior. Right. And, and the reason I made that caveat is because Anthony Harris, uh, like taking over for Andrew Sandejo, uh, and then becoming the starter next year doesn't feel like roster rotation to me. Like it's not the same as like Sheldon Richardson playing for Tom Johnson, I think is who he directly replaced or, or Shamar Stefan playing for Sheldon Richardson. Right. Like in terms of roster rotation, your expected starters, you kept basically nine or 10 of the 11, uh, every single year. And now it feels like there could be like six changes. Like if they trade Anthony Harris, which again, they might just like not do. So we can't like always keep baking it into our analysis and, and just write it off with an if. But, uh, if they trade Anthony Harris, you know, then you've got a starter at safety, uh, three starters at corner. Um, cause I will, I would count my cues as a, as a, as a, as a rotation or a change because Anthony Harris took over for Sandeo and just started. Hughes is just on the roster. It's not the same thing. So uh, three starters at corner, one at safety, one at defensive tackle, and one at defensive end. You go from a team that hasn't changed their starters on defense more than one or two players each year to one that is changing six, and if Anthony Harris stays on the roster, five. Like, that's enormous, at least for the Vikings. For other teams, that might be kind of like a a slightly... um, 
tumultuous year in terms of changing starters. But like one of the reasons the Vikings defense has been so good is because they've gotten so like deep into Mike Zimmer's scheme that, you know, they don't have to relearn it every year. So you can keep on adding new wrinkles without having to explain the terminology to the other starters. You can play as fast as you want right away at camp. Uh, you have, uh, yeah, chemistry is like a big part of it. And so your zone handoffs, you know, when, when a receiver goes from one zone to another zone, the, the handoff between the defender and in, in, in zone A and zone B is seamless. Um, your communication right before plays is perfect, right? Because you can just say, I need you over there. And everybody understands what that means in terms of how their assignments change. Um, all of that is gone because if half of your defense, if, if five or six of your starters are speaking one language and communicating at one speed, uh, and the other half aren't, you're in for a really bad time. Uh, and so you're, you're not back at square one, right? But you're at a spot where it might feel like you're back at square one with that much roster turnover. So it'll be kind of interesting to see how the Vikings adapt. Um, it's a much different beast than, you know, Zimmer taking over in 2014 and immediately improving the defense with like a change in starters and, and a change in scheme and stuff like that. Um, because everyone's kind of learning at the same pace, but also improving from like the 28th defense to the 20th defense, which I think is maybe what happened, um, is like not nearly as hard. Like on average, you'll do that. Like on average, you'll move towards the average. Uh, it's not nearly as hard as improving what was the Vikings defense, like sixth in points per drive, fifth in points per game. Um, improving that at all or even maintaining it. Um, that's tough. Maintaining it is really difficult. And so when you lose a bunch of your guys that are very comfortable in the system, that know the language of the system and so on, uh, you're, you're in for a really difficult time, especially when only one of those guys was maybe on the roster before or two of those guys, like if Fadi and Hughes might have an advantage in, in learning the system. So you're really only getting four new guys but four new guys is still pretty big. Like you got a new defensive tackle. You got maybe a rookie cornerback and a, and a free agent cornerback. Uh, and maybe they sign someone like Drake Kirkpatrick or, um, or, or Dark has or I think tra- you'd have to trade for Kirkpatrick, I think, but, um, maybe they bring that in and, and, you know, he's, they're comfortable with Durante Jones, the defensive backs coach that they got from the Bengals. Uh, and, and the systems are close enough that they can kind of learn on an accelerated rate. And so, but now you're still, you still have a safety that has to figure things out, right? You still have a cornerback that has to figure things out. You got a defensive tackle that has to figure things out. Um, so you're still in a difficult spot. Uh, and it's not like coming from the same system. You automatically know everything. Um, you still have to make adjustments. And so it's, it's, it's it, like you said, the defense is gutted in a really significant way. And so not having enough moves in free agency to resolve that, at least fill in gaps with talent. Like if you lose chemistry, but gain talent, you're probably better off. Um, but. Yeah, I didn't even talk about Michael Pierce replacing Linval Joseph as a, as a new starter. Yeah, that's another added to the list. Um, you're probably better off, but that's still an issue you have to overcome. Uh, and now they're, they're not even replacing the talent. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, that's, um, I don't know. It, it's, it's, I think it's easier to be gloomy about the way the offseason has progressed thus far than it was to be about the prospects for the Vikings going forward after the San Francisco game. And everyone was really gloomy about it after the San Francisco yeah. game. But you break it down and you say, hey, this is what it might look like if they have a successful offseason. And now none of that is materialized. No, it's, it's you know, it comes off as, as you know, Vikings fans and Vikings Twitter just complaining like, wow, the most, what seemed like one of the most stable t- teams over the last couple of years with the way they put the team together is completely falling apart. And is this, is there some like canary in the coal mine sort of situation? Like all these guys are leaving. Is there something actually wrong with the way that Minnesota is handling things right now? You know, you hear horror stories right now coming out of Detroit with people leaving the lions. And one of the, one of the complaints they have is about Matt Patricia yelling at players for not knowing when Ford field was, was made like that sort of stuff is starting to leak out. I wonder if it's going to be a situation where it's a great line. It's a great dumb thing, 
<laughs> don't get me wrong, but it's the it's the sort of thing that leaks out eventually. And there just haven't been any real leaks other than, you know, Diggs not being happy. But I wonder if we're going to reach a point that you know, the, the 2020 Viking season ends up getting marred with just, you know, little leaks about how things are, you know, unrealistic or, you know, asking too much or players being like, I, we can't play for him anymore. Yeah, that's like really fascinating, right? Because on one end, you've got, you know, Jaron, we didn't even talk about Jaron Curse. Um, Jaron Curse was absolutely not going to sign with the Vikings. He said as much. Stephon Diggs demanded to trade out. Mackenzie Alexander was clearly frustrated with the Vikings, decided not to sign with them. Uh, likely as a result of that. Um, but on the other end, you've got like Terrence Newman coming back to play as his legs were falling off. You've got Anthony Barr turning down the Jets at the last second because he was sick at the thought of not playing with the Vikings. Um, you know, Everson Griffin, does, does that have anything to do with anything? Um, did, did, did the locker room kind of, or, or, or this relationship with the coaches impact his decision to not come back to the Vikings? Um, I, it, it, it's really difficult to parse because you, you talk to the players that at least played for multiple years in Cincinnati and they'd like run through a wall for Zimmer. And for the most part, that seems to be the case with a lot of players on the defense, generally speaking, and, and perhaps a lot of the players in the offense. Um, but I think this is the first time we feel like, you know, players feel jilted by the Vikings or the coaching staff or something. And that has impacted their ability to retain them because last year um, it was like the opposite. Like, Oh, the Vikings are such a great environment to be in. Anthony Barr turned down more money. He almost threw up at the thought of not playing for the Vikings. Like that's like a great story for the narrative that the, that players love Mike Zimmer. And now, you know, you, you see these defensive back cleaving and you remember that one time that uh, was it Terrence Newman decided not to to play the the call in the field and and call their own defense um in like week 16 of a game for like eight snaps or something like that uh and you're like oh wow we called that a mutiny at the time and maybe maybe it was a bit much to call it a mutiny but was it you know all, all these defensive acts so it is unusual um because we go from one narrative to the other really quickly and both have uh, some pretty good substantiation behind it but it has now begun to hurt the team. Um, although I suppose you could argue that, you know, signing an off ball linebacker at $13.5 million also hurts the team. But um, it, it hurt the team in terms of their ability to get what they wanted to get done. Um, so, yeah. Uh, it's odd. And it feels yeah. like something is coming with uh, with all of this. And I'm not entirely sure what. And And if this is... If this is just simply being, you know, just, you know, over, over reading some of the, some of the tea leaves here, or maybe this is just being a bit, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, or if this is just being like overly superstitious or whatever, but it does have an odd feel to it. And the fact that there's not an extension in place for Zimmer or for Spielman for that matter, I, I don't know if it compounds this, but it, it almost points in, in the direction of, of there being some sort of thing happening or some some sort of like thing coming i don't know am i am i reading too much into this i I feel like something odd is is going on with the team well i i I don't think you are because you're not like drawing any hard conclusions that would be the line where we say well we don't know but i think it's fair to like ask these questions or mention that it feels unusual right so long as we're not like too conclusive in in our statements tinfoil hats out and whatnot Right. Yeah, yeah. It is uh, concerning. Um, I, I think that's fair. By the way, uh, as far as 2019 free agents go, uh, I think the most pro- the, 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 the one that, that got everyone's attention outside of bar and re-signing um, um, or, you know, Klein and re-signing Dan Bailey was the pickup of Sean Mannion. Sean Mannion is the one that you forgot. Forgot yeah. is the wrong word, but we we have since Dude. extended him. That's like the only move that we made last year, other than Barr leaving the Jets at the altar. So it's yeah, really no. You forgot about Shamar Stefan. Oh, and Shamar Stefan as well. Fine. <laughs> you, yeah, yeah, big moves, big moves. <laughs> um, huge. Yeah, well, they they decided that that was a good decision, so they have re-signed Sean Mannion. Uh, 
and you know, if, if we want to continue talking about backups, they have re-signed Sean Hill and they have offered a second round tender to Eric Wilson. So great. Uh, backups secured. <laughs> it's about time, quite frankly. Woo. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, I, I don't. I don't want to. Um, I don't want to like undercut the importance of backups. I was just complaining about depth, but like, <laughs> let me be clear. You know, I want to be right. Is, yeah, that is by its nature secondary to resolving your concerns at starter. So. <laughs> All right. What we're going to do is we're going to break off before the mailbag. We're going to break off over to Patreon to discuss a couple of things, including the origin of the show. We've had a couple of questions about how the show kind of came to be and some inside baseball terms that we've used or, you know, why is the Loch Ness Monster such an important part of Norse code? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so we'll be discussing that for uh, for just a couple of minutes over at uh, patreon.com slash Norse code if you're interested. Otherwise, here is the mailbag. All right, let's uh, actually before we go to the mailbag, the, the, the fun, as we mentioned last episode of recording during the middle of the day uh, on a weekday is that. We have all sorts of you know, breaking news or you know, you know, transactions that are happening. And uh, Arif, what's our what's our breaking news stuff of, of today? There's four pieces of breaking news. The first is that Cowboys All Pro Center Travis Frederick is retiring. That's pretty insane. That's a lot. That's massive uh, for us for an offensive line like the Cowboys that's you know, vaulted as this like magnificent offensive line. The center is a very very underrated yeah. position. I mean, they spent a first round pick at a time when you would not spend first round picks on centers, uh, paid off basically right away. Uh, unlike let's say the Vikings. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's huge. I mean, obviously he's been struggling with, um, uh, condition. I think it was a Guyan bar syndrome or something like that. Guyan bar syndrome. Um, that was two years ago. Uh, really rough, but, uh, it clearly played a role in his decision. He posted the whole thing to his social media. Also, uh, two cornerbacks that I had identified in uh, my piece that where the Vikings can kind of clarify the direction they can move in uh, and successfully navigate the the second half of free season or the or free agency season, uh, free season. Uh, Quentin Dunbar, who was ru- rumored to be on the trade block, indeed was on the trade block and was traded to the Seahawks for a fifth round pick, which, uh, man, would you trade Corey Vedvik for Quentin Dunbar? Because I would. That without even thinking a fifth round pick, that's, you know, that that's backup backup stuff right there. Yeah. I mean, they could have had a starting big outside corner who had a really phenomenal 2019 for a fifth round pick. And yeah, they decided they didn't need to uh, also identified cornerback Jimmy Smith signing back with the Ravens for a one year deal. Six million dollars. Uh, obviously, he's got this huge injury history, but. When he's on, he's an incredible corner. Um, that seems like that's a gamble worth taking. Um, didn't do that. Uh, Mary Kay Cabot broke uh, that the Vikings trade talks with the Browns have basically sloughed off. Um, the potential, what was it? Uh, the Vikings were basically asking for a second round pick, I think. Um what is it? Yeah, he's not in the cart. The trade is not in the cards at this point. Browns made that clear when they signed safeties Carl Joseph and Andrew Sandeo to one-year deals last week, which, I mean, I, I feel like neither of them are, like, guaranteed starters, so that, that's kind of a weird thing to say. Um, but, you know, whatever. In addition to a source telling Cleveland.com that the Vikings would want at least a third-round pick for Harris and probably a second, he'd also likely want double-digit millions on an extension. Both things are too rich for the Browns right now. Which is interesting because I don't know why the Browns would begin talks trading with the Vikings um, if they were not willing to give Harris an extension worth a double digit millions. Like, what? What? <laughs> why, why are you trying to trade for this guy then? That's clearly what he wants. Um, so, yeah, it looks like that's off, but we do know that the Vikings asking price is probably a second round pick, which uh, is what we estimated earlier in the show. Um, so, cool. Uh, I think that's all the breaking news. Well, I mean, you're if we're going to talk about the XFL, Jordan Tamu also just uh, signed with the Chiefs. Oh, God damn it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I didn't expect the Vikings to be in on him. But, oh. in fact, I think Darren Wolfson said he was, they weren't in on him. But, man, they already have a good quarterback. They can't get, like, 
a decent backup too. That sucks. Yeah. Uh, I, I really like Jordan Tam. I think he's actually a better prospect than, than PJ Walker with regards to XFL quarterbacks, uh, which is why I know you're tuning in. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, PJ Walker, crazy exciting, super fun to watch. Most exciting quarterback in the XFL, which weirdly was a meaningful statement this year. Uh, it was. It was. It was fun to watch for when it was on. It was. Yeah. It was entertaining. A lot of the things that they did wrong last time, they did right this time. Yeah, it feels weird to say. Hey, if someone told you that the XFL was shut down because of a pandemic, you would have said, "Yeah, of course." But it would not have come across your mind that they didn't cause the pandemic. So, <laughs> just the worst case of MRSA, just the absolute. Right. Just yeah, you would have been like, "Oh yeah, I could see the XFL shutting down. That makes sense." Um, but yeah, no, interestingly, victims of circumstances they did not create. <laughs> Oh my, yes. So, <laughs> P.J. Walker, by the way, uh, he signed with Carolina, didn't he? Yeah, and, and and Lewis Riddick thinks that he's got a real shot to outcompete Teddy Bridgewater, um, which uh, is interesting. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but that's kind of interesting because they're basically opposites, right? Walker is uh, exciting, dynamic, uh, threw a lot of interceptable passes. Didn't They weren't all picked off or anything like that. Um, and that's kind of the reason I don't think he was as good of a, a prospect. He was just a more exciting quarterback to watch. Um, but he had phenomenal legs. Uh, you know, he was really dynamic. He could be a threat on the run, a threat on the scramble, uh, a threat to, to open up things in the pocket by moving around a ton, uh, took a bunch of deep shots, uh, but also threw a bunch of interceptable passes, was very exciting, dynamic, and loved being aggressive. Teddy is basically the opposite of all that, except for the fact that at least before the injury, he was really great at moving around in the pocket and creating some extra room. But he's a very conservative quarterback, doesn't throw a ton of picks. Um, they both hold on to the ball a little bit longer, but but Walker um, generally gets rid of the ball much quicker than Teddy does. So, uh, which is kind of interesting because you think of scrambling quarterbacks holding on to the ball a lot. So, opposite style quarterbacks. It'll be interesting to see kind of if there's a true competition there, uh, what they prefer uh in terms of their style of quarterback um uh, kind of exciting i kind of wanted teddy to just have a shot on his own and honestly i do think he'll beat out pj walker because we're talking about a guy who was on the practice squad for three years um who couldn't beat out uh brian hoyer i think for a backup spot with the colts who was i don't forget who the backup quarterback was but before they traded for jacoby Brissett, while andrew luck was still there so i i think teddy's gonna win but it is kind of fun to think that there might be an actual competition. Yeah. All right. Let's hit the mailbag. And the first question is from Bill Botke. says, I hope you're both safe and James is feeling better. Uh, I work from home and as such, I'd like to ask you a couple Vikings questions, uh, draft questions specifically. Uh, first, I enjoy playing with the NFL mock draft simulators. The draft network, uh, the draft network seems quite good, but I also like playing with fan speak and testing out different boards at this time, which expert board seems like the best. Um, so I would be saying this, even if he wasn't a colleague of mine at the athletic, um, Dane Brugler, uh, I think that his board tends to be, tends to do, uh, the better job among all the expert boards in terms of predicting both draft outcomes and predicting how the draft will actually go. And the reason I can say that is because I do a consensus board every year, which gathers, uh, between 35 to 50 boards in recent years, 50, um, from from various draft experts around the internet. So, uh, you know, all the way to to independent blogs, uh, up to, uh, you know, media boards from like NFL.com, ESPN.com, and stuff like that. So been able to compare Todd McShay and Mel Kuyper and Dave Brugler and uh, when he was still in the media, Mike Mayock, who actually previously held the crown in terms of being able to predict player outcomes uh, with his big board. So it was appropriate that he ended up getting hired by a team. Um, you know, I was able to compare all of them uh, along with uh, the experts at uh, the Draft Network and so on. And and Brugler consistently pulled ahead. Um, so he is uh, a person that I think uh, really does, from a, a data perspective, do a very good job at, at predicting how players will do when they enter the NFL. Um, so that and, and I'll recommend some others when we get further along 
uh, because there's another question that kind of ties into this. Um, but to answer this specific question, I think Brugler's board is the best. Right now, I don't think he has a new top 100 from uh, after the combine. Uh, and so when that comes out, that'll be a really significant kind of sea change in terms of uh, the way to to rank the players. But honestly, the consensus board is the best at, at, at all of it. Uh, it just does not have scouting reports, so you can't really learn about the players. So for the purposes of learning about the players, which is how I think this question is designed, I would look at Brugler. Otherwise, um, if I were going to pick one expert at the draft network, uh, which is tough. Um, I think Solak, Benjamin Solak, does a really great job of kind of explaining what he's seeing, and he does a good job kind of predicting player outcomes. Uh, and so if you've got a scouting report and you've got a bunch of tabs open at the draft network for the different scouting reports, uh, I, I take a quick look at Solak's. So he, his is pretty good stuff. Uh, next question from him is, uh, when I run the simulations, I often see a buildup of linebacker, running back, safety, and edge where the Vikings pick in the first round. Despite the fact that the Vikings have greater needs, are any of these players too good to pass up? Uh, at running back, absolutely not, um, for a lot of reasons that we've covered on the show. But uh, A, this is not as great a running back class. So as the running backs build up, that's kind of a reflection of that fact. Um and the same is true of edge, where the, the edge players build up because they're just not that good um, relative to other classes. So, yeah, I mean, you know, if J.K. Dobbins falls to the third round, I'm sure the Vikings will pounce. If if Yedder Gross Matos falls to the second round, I'm sure the Vikings will be interested. So it's not saying that there are no talented players or that no players worthy of, you know, the second or third round pick are, are worth picking, but I would not go there. Um uh, Linebacker, I think, is is similarly weak, but not as weak at as as uh, as edges, and also not as replaceable as running back is. Like, not only is the running back class kind of weak, but as you kind of go down the running back draft board, um, you know, the the, the historically it, it just hasn't been as important where a running back has been picked. Um, so I, I would not kind of go above and beyond to pick a running back, especially because the Vikings have you know some pretty good running backs on the roster. Uh, linebacker is, it's not as interesting to me. I think last year you had the same problem. Whereas after you got past the first two linebackers, it was just not a great class. Um, same kind of problem for the Vikings, uh, at linebacker this year when they evaluate these prospects after like three or four, you kind of have a problem after you get past Kenneth Murray and Patrick Queen and, and, uh, and Malik Harrison in some order, obviously with Isaiah Simmons kind of at the top, if you consider him a linebacker. Um, you end up with kind of a, a weak middle. So I think those are the reasons that when you go through these simulators, these players are building up is that they're not that good. The one exception I would say is safety. Um, but the problem is that's the most difficult position to evaluate for a lot of these third party evaluators that are writing scouting reports. Um, initially the biggest problem was that it, they would just not be on the screen. And so it'd be difficult to evaluate a player that wasn't on the screen. Um, but now a lot of these third party groups have been able to grab uh, all 22 uh, from colleges in, in, in various ways. And so they're doing a better job of being able to evaluate the safety position. But the history of being able to evaluate that position has not been built up. There's no like institutional understanding from a lot of these because they, they all learn from each other. Right. Uh, so there's no institutional understanding like there has been for quarterback uh, to evaluate safeties. And so. In some years, it feels like we're probably overvaluing box safeties, right? Like I think Landon Collins was overvalued the year he was coming out. Um, and, and, but, you know, and that question drove us to, to figure out, Hey, are we overvaluing Jamal Adams? And it turns out we weren't. Um, you know, he, he ended up actually being quite good. And so it's difficult to kind of balance those things. So that is kind of growing in terms of our ability to evaluate the position. Um, and, and that class is pretty diverse, but I do think that there's a lot of talent there. And I would grab a safety at some point in the draft. Maybe, you know, if Kavon Wallace falls to the fourth and it looks like he might, that would be kind of an interesting consideration if Ashton Davis falls to the third, which seems unlikely. But, you know, if he falls to the third, that would be an interesting consideration. Um, you know, if the Vikings view Kyle Duggar as a linebacker, you know, A, that adds depth to the linebacker class, but B, um, you know, you could have a guy kind of replace J. Ron Kirst, but he's more athletic. Um, 
you know, if he falls to the second or even to the third, if, if that's even possible, you know, that's, that's somebody that could be kind of interesting that you could have as a hybrid linebacker safety. Um, yeah, I, I think that there are safeties throughout this class that be appropriate at their pick slot. There's a reason the Vikings keep getting, uh, uh, mocked Antoine Winfield, although the reason is more to do with, with history than it does with a need, but Winfield can still play nickel and, and the Vikings don't have that. So, um, I think that as in the simulators, as safety builds up, that's something where it actually does make sense to, uh, to take a shot. But the other three positions, um, that's, that's mostly a talent problem and a running backs just matter less problem. Yeah. Kyle Slaby asks, okay, if at the senior bo- at the senior bowl, you had given Rick a full analysis of how free agency had shaken out thus far, do you think they would have extended Kirk? Does this seem like they took several risks that didn't and they didn't pan out, or was the uh, front office anticipating an exodus and wanted stability at quarterback? Also, just to clarify, I don't want to say what they what he would say to the media. I want to assume that Arif and James are close friends with Rick and off the record. <laughs> Yeah, I, I assume this question was like, and Rick like believes you, and yes. and yeah. Um, so I think if it happens, I think he still extends Kirk, but he makes other or different moves, right? Like I think, um, so and he might still have to trade Stephon Diggs, right? But I think that they do more in the pre-tampering process. Uh, so the uh, so legal tampering begins on Monday, right? And deals get get to sign on on Wednesday, right? Um, two days before the, the free agency period officially opens. But the real negotiating for free agents occurs at the NFL Combine when players and agents and, uh, well, not players, but when agents and general managers are, you know, in the same environment and atmosphere all the time, you can't enforce your tampering rules then. And so that's when real negotiations start. And maybe, you know, the Vikings begin those negotiations on a receiver earlier. There's a piece at, at Monday Morning Quarterback by Albert Breer that indicates that the Vikings were not necessarily planning on trading Stephon Diggs the day that they ended up trading him. And so the tweet, and I'll have to reread the story to see if this is literally how it went down, but from my understanding of it, the tweet where he says it's time for a new beginning actually began a lot of these trade talks, which is not to say the Vikings haven't been fielding offers all year for Stephon Diggs, because they have been, but they were mostly saying no, right? And I think it took until... Stefan Diggs, I guess, tweeted that out for them to come around to beginning a negotiating process. Um, I'll link that in the show notes. I want you all to take a second look and not just take my word for it, but that was my impression from the piece that there was a six hour window basically where the Vikings uh, ended up. So they did not know that they were going to trade Stefan Diggs, which means that when they were initially talking to all of these agents, some of whom represent some receivers that were kind of entering uh, free agency, they did not build the framework for a deal for them to be able to uh, begin the negotiating process. So they probably would have done that. Uh, they probably would not have said at the combine that they expect Everson Griffin to be back. They probably would have reached out feelers to, to edge defenders in free agency. They probably would have explored the trade market at cornerback a little bit more. Um, they probably would have done other things if they could have anticipated what would happen in free agency um, a little bit better to kind of secure um, all of these other, uh, positions. So, um, I think, I think free agency would have played out a lot differently if they could perfectly predict what would happen without, you know, uh, any intervention, but I don't think they would have prevented themselves from signing Kirk. I think the only reason that they extend Kirk Cousins is because they do believe he has the ability to win, uh, the Super Bowl and then they needed to create room for him. The issue is that they would have approached free agency differently if they had known that these hurdles would have appeared, right? If they had known that, you know, Quentin Dunbar was on the trade market for a fifth round pick, which like, I don't know how you can't know that if we know that Quentin Dunbar is on the, on the trade market, certainly every general manager should know he's on the trade market. So they should talk to, to Washington about that, especially if they're theoretically already talking to Washington about Trent Williams. So I think they approach free agency differently, but I still think that they extend Kirk Cousins, but Maybe they had already begun discussing with Robbie Anderson what the terms of a deal would look like, and they would have already signed him or something like that. So I think they would have approached the the period a lot differently, but I still think they extend Cousins because they think they can win with him. Um, I'm I'm curious about kind of what 
happens with Anthony Harris in that scenario, if they've got other trade partners lined up that are not the Browns that they're still negotiating with, um, maybe that doesn't change at all. But, you know, that that could be part of, uh, of something interesting as well. Uh, next question is from uh, Luke Braun, who asks, if the Vikings packaged Anthony Harris and one of the first in a trade deal, what sort of player could they get back? Are any such players available slash realistic? Uh, wait, what about Odell Beckham? A first plus a second for a player that um, you can probably get something back too, right? For a player that has worn out his welcome in Cleveland who had just traded for him for a first and, and change. Um, you'd probably be able to get a pick back as well. You trade Anthony Harris in a first for Odell Beckham and then also grab, so, which I know Vikings fans are not being enthused by having just dealt with like Stefan Diggs, who's like not nearly as much of a locker room uh, problem as, as Odell Beckham is. Um, but I, that sounds like it's very easy to get excited about that too, right? Like crazy easy. So it seems like that's the only a player you could pull. It seems like the only trade partner that the Vikings seem to have this season, other than other than Buffalo, I suppose, as I shoot my argument in the foot, is uh, is Cleveland. Is that the Stefanski influence, or is it just coincidence that the Vikings have been in trade talks with Cleveland about a number of different players? I, I I think it's neither Stefanski nor coincidence because like through multiple front offices they seem to have a poisonously good trade relationship with the Browns right because they've been able to like trade down one spot multiple times uh, for like free um, yeah I I don't know it, they seem to trade a lot with the Browns uh, I don't get it but yeah I mean that's that's a that's that's a potential. I don't know what other high value players are on the trade block. Um, oh, also, if the Vikings knew about DeAndre Hopkins beforehand, yeah, you know, they they probably would have done something. <laughs> that but yeah, yeah, you could it's the one few areas where you could upgrade it. Um, so to answer uh, the the prior question, um, but yeah, uh, what are other players that are like potentially on the trade block that are really high value that you need to package a first? and a player that you're currently valuing at a second. Um, I'd have to think about that a little bit. There's like not a ton that would be actively on the trade market. You'd have to create a market and force a team to, to kind of consider. So we'd have to figure out kind of like who needs a safety, right? Um, I don't think that you could pry like Mike Evans or Chris Godwin from the Bucks because that's part of the package that attracts Tom Brady. So that, that doesn't happen there. But... Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know who plays opposite Kevin Bayard in in Tennessee, but uh, you could probably pull some players from Tennessee that are pretty interesting. Um, now I'm thinking about it. I can't think of anybody that they would because they wouldn't give up AJ Brown. Um, hey, there's probably something you could do. Uh, and they gave up uh, that one dude for like a seventh, uh, Draw Casey. Yeah, be nice to know about that beforehand too. Um, yeah, I can't think, I can't, the kind of question took me a little bit by surprise because I can't think of players that are worth that much that teams would actively be willing to trade. Um, probably an edge player somewhere. Someone's got to be upset. Yeah. They're really good at, you know, playing the edge and they play for some crappy team. There's got to be eight of those. Uh, James asks with how poorly Rhodes played this past year and how average Wayne's was, can our cornerback play get much that much worse in 2021? You absolutely know that it can. <laughs> We've seen it. We've seen it worse. I saw it in 2011. It, it, it's totally possible. As a side note, I'm really getting tired to get of, of being burned while playing Madden by anyone with an efficient pass offense. I'm so <laughs> tired of getting picked apart. Like, I know that they're going to throw to Tyreek Hill. I know that I have Xavier Rhodes on him. I can't do a damn thing about it. It's just like, okay, you got broken Xavier Rhodes and averages Trey Waynes, but would you rather have Asher Allen and Chris Cook? <sighs> what about AJ Jefferson? Really? It absolutely could get worse. Are we. Uh, uh, we're just going through the, the highlight reel of, of people that we shot into the sun. Uh, Benny Sapp, <sighs> post third ACL, uh, Cedric Griffin. This is turning into the, uh, turning into the old Deadspin article of remember these guys? 
<laughs> Benny Sapp. I'm, I'm talking about name. guys for like this decade, too. I know. <laughs> like, Benny Sapp is a name I hadn't thought of in a really long time. There's a lot of episodes that we talked about Benny Sapp, mainly in preseason. Uh, Brian Scheel asks, I think the prospect of regular season games played in empty stadiums is real. With no, with no fan energy, or sorry, with no fan energy, how do you think that would affect the play on the field? So to prep me for this question, James sent me two clips of uh, WWE and AEW wrestling uh, dealing with this issue, and it is... A lot. It's fascinating, <laughs> isn't it? How different and 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 the the real the, the real answer to this is it depends on how it's filmed, but it's so weird to watch because it, 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 realistically it's the only quasi sporting event that's going on right now, and they're doing it without an audience, and a lot is lost in 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 the in the viewing of it. I don't know right. if much and, is gained, but a lot is lost. Yeah, it's well, what 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 you gain, I guess, is like a bunch of interesting papers you could write. But that's about it. Um, I I would argue that like wrestling requires more immediate fan energy as a part of its product than uh, any like actual sport. I don't want to call wrestling not a sport because they're all athletes, but it's not a sport because it's scripted. Um, but like, uh, it requires a lot of fan energy, right? And, and that's a big part of the sell of its product. And what's really interesting is that when they're attempting to sell a lot of these moves, one thing that really helps sell it is fan reaction to the moves, right? It's, it's, it's like a basic tenet of film editing. When something emotional happens on screen, one of the ways that you can undercut it is to have a reaction shot from a player, from a person player, from a person on film reacting to that emotional thing in a big way and audiences connect to it. It's kind of the same thing with wrestling. Yeah. Um, it, hell, they do it in, in football and basketball all the time. When something big happens, one of the cutaway shots before or after a replay is to a fan in the stands. And you'll right? hear the so, roar of the crowd freaking out over it. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, it's more important to wrestling, I think, but um, it, it, it does undercut something. Uh, one thing that I found kind of fascinating was the echoes. The physical bodies that the audience possesses, like, absorbs the echo, right? And then also drowns it out by, like, screaming and shouting and stuff like that. And so the echo is the worst part because it, it gives you a sense of the cavernousness of what they're doing and the isolation of what they're doing. I think more than anything else, because you see these these shots in the background, which I think this is a problem with the way the WWE filmed it, these shots in the background of, like, no fans in the stands. Uh, and... uh it, it it sucked, but it's the echoes that really sold it. And and that was the big problem with the AEW stuff. I thought they did a much better job and they had, you know, more people around that were like part of the production and they had tighter shots. So you couldn't see the, 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 the seats as much. Um, and they had more people on stage in the clip I saw cause it was like a, a battle Royale. So there's a much more sound to like have, but you can't trend. And, and the, and the announcers I think had more energy, um, but you can't, eliminate the echo and so there, there was always that sense so that was stultifying but we have had similar experiences because the AAF as because I watched the AAF all the way to the end as it was winding down it didn't have a ton of fans in stands and it sapped energy in a big way but I don't think it was nearly as bad for them and mind you they had at least some fans um, but it was I don't think it was bad as them as it was for uh, these wrestling performances, especially because they're open air stadiums instead of closed air ones. Uh, and even the football closed stadiums, the domes don't echo as much as, as the arenas that they're performing in for wrestling. And so that's a big part of it too. But th there was a product there that certainly lacked an energy that a crowd would provide, but it wasn't nearly as devastating, I think, as it was for watching the wrestling. It, I think so, you had uh, I think you had commented before the show that it felt less like a wrestling match and more like watching two guys fight outside of a bar. Yeah, it was like the bar is closing, guys. Let's get a move on. <laughs> That's what it felt like. Get your off sale and leave. Take this. Take care of this at your own house. Yeah, it just it just really felt like way. I didn't feel like a performance because it felt like a performance. If that makes sense, like. The sell about wrestling is that it's soap opera with fighting, right? 
and the performance like you buy into it so it doesn't feel like a performance but now it's like laid bare how much of a performance it is and it's very unsettling yeah uh next question is going to be from don from ohio who asks whose dog did josh klein kick it's a callback Yours. to uh, to a former episode, either yeah. I, either intentionally or not, where we asked uh, which kicker was it that 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 we were trying to figure out why he was still on the team and if he would get if he would get like cut if he kicked somebody's dog. Was it Dan Bailey? I don't remember. I feel like it was a conversation on if Dan Bailey kicked a dog. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to remember which. It wasn't Blair Walsh because he was on the team for like a year longer. Than he should have been. No, I don't but think it was you're implying that. something much more recent. <laughs> I think it was Dan Bailey. You answer the question. I'll, well, I mean, you, don't, you can't really answer that one. But Don also asks if he can get coronavirus from listening to this podcast. You, are, you live in Ohio. You likely already have it. <laughs> uh, yeah, of all the diseases this podcast causes, coronavirus is probably not one of them. No. <laughs> and we're not even giving out advice on like different medicines you could take that could potentially kill you either. So let's go to a question from Ethan Frost who, uh, who asks, uh, I get the impression that Arif has attempted to get better at scouting the last couple of years. Any tips for understanding uh, how to scout? Uh, also about uh, book ideas to, to, uh, to uh, read uh, this particular listener seems to enjoy uh, take your eye off the ball. Yeah. So, um, there's there's a couple of things. The first is that I've 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 been trying to get better to, at, at scouting uh, since I began writing, right? Because I didn't know anything about about football, um, and you know, arguably I still don't, depending on who you ask. Uh, um, but uh, what, I mean, one of the first things I did it was like 2014. One of the first things I did was I I scouted the entire wide receiver class. I think all the way down to 87 receivers for the Daily Norseman, and I broke them into tiers, and it was something I'm pretty proud of, and it ended up actually aging really well. Um, the receivers I liked were, were generally pretty good. So, um, yeah, that, uh, that, that, that was something that I'd, I'd done like way back when. And so, um, I've always tried to get better at, at the scouting side because I intuitively, I just have a better understanding of the data side because, uh, that's the, the kind of stuff that, that, that I worked with that transferred, that was translatable to football, Whereas the scouting stuff, I didn't have a background in that was translatable. So I started off with a lot more data in my, in my work than I, than even I, than I, than I have now. Um, but the scouting and the X's and O stuff, which, you know, are two different things, but people tend to group them together because they're both film analysis. That's something I've always been, been trying to improve upon. Um, and so I, I've read a lot and that's, you know, been a super important part of the way I've learned about it. Uh, take your eye off the ball by Pat Kirwan was one of the first books that I read to try and get better at it. It is not, I think, my favorite book to introduce to people just because I think a lot of the stuff in there, and Pat Kirwanian, he's a former general manager, I think. He's certainly been in NFL front offices, and he and, he's, and he writes for CBS uh, now, but, but more then. Um, he's a great communicator. I don't think that that book is as great a foundation as it once was because I think scouting has evolved in a really big way. And the amount of information people have access to right now was is much larger than the amount of information they had access to back when the first was originally that book was first originally published. And so all the stuff that he's talking about is stuff that is, I think, a lot easier to access now than it was before. And so a lot of it's kind of background information or it's kind of outdated. I mean, he's got a, a metric in there that he calls explosion score, where he basically adds uh, the broad jump in 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 feet and vertical jump in inches and or broad jump in like not in feet but the broad jump in something the vertical jump in inches and the bench press uh together and and that's your explosion score and you know no one uses that now not even in nfl front offices and stuff like that the essential lesson of the book that football is better understood by taking your eye off the ball that's true and accurate and i don't want to beg the book too much because most of it's correct but that I I stopped recommending that book to people just because uh, there's a lot more to learn, I think, uh, than that book. And I think that book has been essential to football writing, so I don't want to bag on it too much. And it's been a big part, but I just think now there's a lot better resources. So in terms of books I would recommend, I think the first thing to learn is how 
what is happening on each play. Because I don't think you can scout players unless you have a basic understanding of the X's and O's. There's a bunch of really great books for it. I'm going to rattle them off really quickly, but I'm also going to put them in the show notes. So, um, two books by Chris Brown, Chris B. Brown. Uh, so not, you know, the, the famous one. Uh, the Essential Smart Football and Art of Smart Football. I think Art of Smart Football is basically a sequel to The Essential Smart Football. Both are really great. Um, they do a really good job of digging into X's and O's. Um, before reading that, so those two are some of my favorite books on it. Before reading that, I would read uh, The Games That Changed the Game by Ron Jaworski, a really excellent book. Um, I know a ton of people are not necessarily big fans of his commentary or announcing, but this book is really excellent. Um, Blood, Sweat, and Chalk by Tim Layden uh, does a really great great job delving into the history of the game, uh, and and it does a really good job of the X's and O's, um, and so do games that change the game. They basically go into seven games that forwarded uh, pioneering concepts in NFL X's and O's and does a lot to like tell you, hey, this is why Sid Gilman is really important to the history of football and the history of passing, and here's what Bill Walsh's contributions to schemes actually were. You know, the phrase West Coast offense doesn't tell you as much as, you know, the mechanics of how it works. Um, and the invention of the slot receiver kind of goes into that. Uh, uh, another recent book that kind of that gets into the same uh, football history aspect that allows you to understand X's and O's a little bit better. The Genius of Desperation by Doug Farrer. It was very recently published. I recommend that. Um, and then uh, for for like how front offices are run, I read War Room by Michael Hawley, which delves into how Belichick is set up the front office with the Patriots based off of his history with the brands and how that worked and what system goes there. That is really good. Um, and then if you want to go deeper, then I'd go into the Chris Brown books, the essential smart football, the art of smart football. Um, and then I think kind of the, the next thing to do is to go into the thinking man's guide to pro football by Paul Z- Zimmerman, who uh, recently passed away. His name is, uh, he was most mostly well known as Dr. Z, he's a sports illustrated contributor, but he really went into the nitty gritty. And that's when you start pivoting from X's and O's to like player evaluation. And he talks about kind of why he thinks, say, he wouldn't put Alan Page on his list of all time defensive tackles. I disagree with him, but you know, learning about kind of the way that he evaluates individual players, I think that t- teaches you a lot about how to look at players. Uh, and then you can get into the complete wide receiver by Jay Norvell, which is a coaching manual. It did not meant to teach you how to evaluate receivers. It's meant to tell you a coach who's fairly familiar with the game, how to coach wide receivers, but you can pick up a lot of things from it about how to play wide receiver. There's also the complete offensive line. That's part of the same series that I've also learned a lot about. I think it's by uh, Dan Gonzalez. I'll double check that when I put it in the show notes. Um, that helped me out a lot. Um, but I, I also have to say, a lot of it comes from watching a ton of games, a lot of all 22. Uh, I've learned a lot from that. I've also talked to uh, a lot of these third-party scouts I mentioned. And so when I go down to the Senior Bowl, I spend a lot of time talking to Kyle Krabs at, at the Draft Network and Joe Marino at the Draft Network and, and Benjamin Solak, who I mentioned. I, you know, John Owning was there. Uh, you know, he's a wizard when it comes down to breaking, uh, breaking down defensive linemen. I've talked to Duke Manyweather and Brandon Thorne uh, about breaking down offensive and defensive linemen. You know, they've done a really great job. Duke sent me like a 30 minute video when I asked him a simple question. It was really great. Um, and so my direct experience helped me out a lot. I talked to, you know, some former Viking scouts about how to evaluate offensive linemen. You know, that direct experience has also been super helpful for the way I've grown. Um, it's not like necessarily great advice because I don't know how much you can replicate it because I'm watching people evaluate players live right next to me and I'm asking them questions and that's been really big for how I've been able to kind of grow uh, as, as somebody who does this. Um, and if there's a way that you can find that kind of direct experience, you know, I would recommend going into it. And then beyond that, you know, read what other people have to say. Read the scouting reports that Lance Zierlein puts out. Read the scouting reports that Dan Brugler puts out. Read kind of what dra- the Draft Network puts out. Um, look up what the terms that they use mean. I think you can go to YouTube and say, you know, hey, how, how do you rush a passer, right? And, and these instructional videos that are meant for high schoolers learning how to play like defensive end or outside linebacker also teach you about the pass rush moves and the techniques and teach you to, to identify, hey, that isn't, you know, quite 
accurate or that's not really how they should do it or they're mistiming their uh, their spin move. And so that can be part of you learning how, you know, a, a player, um, you know, rushes the passer. And so you, you learn about the technical side of evaluation. Um, one of the best resources I've learned in terms of offensive skill position players uh, to learn about how to evaluate players was Matt Waldman's rookie scouting portfolio. It puts out every year. It's really excellent. I buy it every year. Um, and it goes into detail about his process for quarterbacks, wide receivers, running backs, tight ends. And he breaks down what he evaluates, why he evaluates, what's important, why, you know, this skill that might be super important to playing the position is not super important to evaluation because it's an easy skill to teach. So I don't think about it that much when I'm scouting because it's easy to teach. Well, this skill is tougher to teach, less important to the position, but tougher to teach. And so if they don't have it, um, that's going to be a bigger ding on my scouting report. So that sort of stuff. Um, and he breaks down into, into like 80 different categories. It's really excellent. Um, so I, I recommend buying um, at least one year's worth of that, preferably the most recent year, so you can kind of compare notes. So that's all really great, um, but it requi- It took a ton of investment and time from me to get where I am, and I'm way behind all these guys that I just mentioned. So, um, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's out there now that wasn't there 10 years ago. Um, I'd recommend reading as much as you can from a lot of these people so that you can uh, filter out what you end up finding tends to be the most important or, or least important. That's my really long answer to that question. All right. So while you were doing that, I was searching for the episode where we asked, where we answered the question about would a kicker get released for killing Zimmer's dog? And I haven't found it. However, the working title episode titles that we have for some of these uh, show notes are quite still quite funny <laughs> after after all this time so i've just been i've just been enjoying that i think one of the episodes was <laughs> there must be 50 ways to fix your defense and a couple of other things on there so i've i've enjoyed this uh <laughs> the last couple of minutes listening to that and trying to find that show which i still couldn't find um let's also uh, go from the same question uh assume uh covid slash corona ends up having a big infa- impact on the nfl shortened season slash no fans at the stadium or whatever and this leads to a dramatic drop off in revenue salary cap will be way down in 2021 right does the nfl have that any sort of plan or would every team just be in cap hell i don't know that the nfl has a plan but they just won't let teams be in cap hell because of a revenue thing uh from the broadcast partners um It's indexed off of expected income, I think, for that year. So I don't even think the amount of income you got in the last year actually defines your income for the next year. It's expected income. Um, I would imagine what ends up happening is that everybody's contract tolls. um, And the NFLPA and the NFL would have to come to an agreement about this. But I think that they would both agree that everybody's contract tolls. uh, And so next year, you're, you're... acting as if um the year never happened and uh you still have to draft a new class so it it does present unique difficulties um but yeah i I think that they just act as if that year didn't happen um and uh and and just kind of move on and maybe even have the same salary cap as as before uh there wouldn't be a free agency period probably then uh because if everybody's contract holds then you know, nobody's contract expires at the end of uh, the year. Yeah, no movement would end up being necessary at that point. Yeah. Um, they might even expand the salary cap to uh, allow for you to be able to sign a new draft class. So I don't think that, um, you know, teams would end up, you know, being underwater because of the cap, because of this weird situation involving uh, COVID-19. Ricardo has a has a, has an apology. Uh, Ricardo <laughs> says, "I wanted to apologize for something Mr. Hassan brought up on last show. In my prior email, I addressed Mr. Hassan as such, but addressed James only as James. This was only done because James's surname is the equivalent of a 300 plus score in Scrabble, <laughs> while Mr. Hassan's is well not. Before Mr. Hassan points out that proper names are not allowed in Scrabble, I am aware of this, but chose to ignore it for humor reasons." 
I, I can accept that. Accepted. Yep, I can totally that's accept good. that apology. Yeah, that's uh, fair. Uh, Duke's Code asks, why hasn't Norse Code sent me an email regarding their COVID-19 response plan yet? <laughs> <laughs> so, true story, before this all went to crap and everyone ended up getting quarantined, I had in the drafts uh, portion of Twitter, I, I had tried to form it into a joke about Norse code and, and their, and their COVID-19 response, because I was getting a million emails from things that it's sort of like when you, when your birthday comes around and you get a million emails from a bunch of places, you're like, Oh yeah, that place has my email address. That million place has my email yeah, address. Yeah. It felt like that. So I was forming a tweet to make it, but I couldn't decide if it was offensive or in poor taste and in a, in an astonishing, astonishing uh, amount of, of, of like, of restraint. Of, of restraint i didn't send it out so the, i the classic norse code dilemma you could even call it the norse covid dilemma <sighs> boom i are waiting all show to use that i <sighs> i won't apologize <laughs> well i know what the episode title is now uh be frisky <laughs> Asks the final question of the episode. If you had to be quarantined with one current Viking, one Vikings beat reporter, and one member of the Vikings coaching staff, who would you pick and why? You you have only D&D to entertain yourselves. There are costumes if you choose to wear them. So the fact that D&D is the only thing to keep you entertained drives the decision here. So I have to choose people that feel... Like they would be nerdy enough to buy into D and D uh, if you attempted to teach them uh, and are like cool about it, uh, or have like clearly played it before. Right. Um, so I don't know if any of these players, if these people have clearly played it before, but I feel like they would all be up for it. Um, so the player I chose was Afadio Denebo because he's super laid back and he just seems like he's up for anything. I would have picked Stephen Weatherly, but he's no longer on the team. Um, and Stephen Weatherly has definitely played it. Like, I haven't ever asked him, and he's never said anything about it, but he's almost certainly played it. But Afadi, he seems like he'd be up for it, and he's really chill. And one of the great things about D&D is the interactions that you have with everybody. So you got to pick people that are, uh, you know, fun to be around. Otherwise, D&D sucks, right? It's a social game. Um which unfortunately you've like inflicted me upon these people. So uh, at least one person here is going to be fun uh, and it's going to be a foddy. After that, it was really difficult. I went to the Vikings coaching staff, try and figure out who would be like uh, up for or open to playing D and D. I still think, Nate, I still think Nate Kading is, is the dark horse here. That's a, that's a good choice. And, and, and I, I did not scroll down far enough on the Vikings coaches page to, uh, to, to see that or make that choice, I was actually, when you mentioned him, I was surprised to learn he was actually listed on the coach's page because he's basically a consultant. Um, like, they didn't list Hudson Hoke uh, when they had him consult about the offensive line a couple years ago. Um, but, yeah, I guess uh, uh, Nate Gating is a good pick, but I already made my pick. I picked A.C. Patterson, uh, mostly because he's one of the youngest coaches on the staff. Uh, so that probably helps. I think the younger you are, the more open you are to, like, playing D&D. Um, I don't know anything about him, but he does wear thick glasses, so that's got to help, I think. Um, his dad's the defensive line coach, so he might know Afadi Odenabos. So there's like a chemistry thing there. What is his position uh, with the Vikings again? He is the offensive quality control assistant. Um, so, so is, is he, he the guy with the chart that says what times you should go uh, go for it on fourth down, or is he the the, the Madden guy, the, the one who knows all about the clock management? Uh, he is, uh, probably not any, I mean, he, he, motive his jobs might be to do that. Um, so quality control assistants have basically a ton of jobs. They like get coffee. They have to come up with that chart. Maybe if the coaches ask for it, their primary job is to chart all or to pad all the data that you get from watching an NFL game. And so they'll look at, so with an upcoming com uh, opponent, they'll look at the last four games that like let's say uh they're playing the the raiders in week five or something we'll look at the first four weeks of the season that the raiders have played and chart everything that the raiders did and so they'll say hey on on third and short right the raiders are in this formation uh 67 of the time and importantly when they're in this formation or in this personnel 
they run the ball 82% of the time on third and short in this formation. Uh, so be alert for that. And so he's the one that comes up with the data um, for that. Uh, that's what offensive quality control assistants do. It's like a mind-numbing task. Bonus, it's pretty nerdy. Um, so that helps. But also, uh, to subtract from that, most coaches were quality control assistants at one point. They don't seem to end up being nerds at the end. But that's my choice there. Uh, he is younger, so that helps. He looks like he might be a nerd. I don't know. If not, he probably knows a Fadi, so that helps. Um, then the beat writer was really difficult. Most of this beat doesn't look like they care that much about d and uh, I was down to two choices. Um, one is a Vikings beat writer. I did not end up choosing, choosing him. Sorry, Will Raggetts for, for Sports Illustrated. I'm sure you've played D&D. But I decided to go with the offbeat choice because he's literally off the beat um, most of the time. Dane Mizutani. Um, I chose him because A, he likes a lot of my tweets. That seems cool. B, he seems like he'd be up for D&D. Hell, I bet he's played it. Uh, C, he's really funny, man. Um, I feel like, I feel like that's a good group of people to like play D and D with and survive the oncoming apocalypse. Yeah. All I don't right. think any of us are, are wearing costumes right away, but who knows what happens to our brains in week four of a quarantine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're all looking forward to finding that out. All right. That is going to be it for this episode of Norse code. Arif, what do you have to plug over at the athletic? Yeah. So my currently out of date article, um, that I knew it was going to be out of date as soon as I published it. So I'm not like that worried about it, uh, about how the Vikings off season plans have, uh, been difficult to figure out and navigate. And I think the Vikings put themselves in a difficult situation. Uh, that's up at the athletic. Um, and then also anything that the Vikings do, I'll be reacting to, um, over there, not in real time, like maybe a day later. Uh, the, like when Michael Pierce, uh, was signed or when Stefan Diggs was traded, I had a piece up a day later. So, um, you can find all that at the athletic. Great thing about the athletic right now is that if you click on any of the stories, including mine, so do that, uh, you get a 90 day free trial if you haven't already signed up. So, uh, you know, people need stuff to read during, uh, the apocalypse. Yeah. <laughs> so why not spend it with a reef just like you're doing right now? Or any of like our 400 other writers. I feel like that's more compelling probably than, you know, listening to me just say the stuff I said in the podcast. You really are a great salesman for your work. You know that, right? (laughs) (laughs) I I look forward to your what do you have to plug section every week that we do this. Yeah, I'm going to write something. I am in the middle (laughs) of writing something. And when I post it, I will put it in the show notes. (laughs) It's a pretty common one. Yes. Love it. All right. So that is going to be it for this episode of Norse Code. Uh, if you are interested in listening to the bonus content that we that we went over, uh, it was mainly about the origin of the show and some of the inside jokes. You can do so at patreon.com slash Norse Code. I am working on a better delivery system for, it, uh, for the post, whether it be an RSS feed or something like that. So I will be working on that later this week, but or, you know, tomorrow, since I don't appear to have much to do <laughs> lately. So such as a best pull that you know working from home thing so uh but that is gonna be it for this episode of norse code hope you guys enjoyed it uh not entirely sure when we'll be back probably about two weeks or so to reevaluate what is going on unless there are some major vikings news uh pieces that end up coming out so for a reef my name is james thank you guys so much for listening and please remember to bring your wine towel and we'll see you later norse code is the largest and only division of norse code llc You can find Norse Code on the Daily Norseman, SB Nation's Vikings blog at dailynorseman.com. You can also find it on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever fine podcasts are aggregated. Our Vikings blogger extraordinaire and generally useful human is Arif Hassan, and he can be found on Twitter at Arif Hassan NFL. I am your producer and co-host, and my name is James Pagoshnik. You can find me at the show's official Twitter feed, at NorseCodeDN. If you'd like to donate a few bucks to the show, you can make your one-time donation at paypal.me slash norsecode, or a recurring monthly contribution can be made by visiting patreon.com slash norsecode. Any questions or comments that won't fit in a tweet can also be sent to norsecodepodcast at gmail.com. On behalf of the Norse Code staff, we thank you so much for listening. Our formula is this. We go out... We hit people in the mouth.